you know, it's funny listening to um, to Jill's description of, of you know, sort of surprise at thinking that nurses could be you know, forgotten. There, there are just so many different ways of forgetting what work is and who does it. And the way I want to talk about is the way that we forget work that isn't actually booked or logged as work. Um, so when we think about this kind of work, informal care that's provided to people with health or functional needs by a friend or family member. This is something that I would have described in my research as a crisis before the pandemic. Um, nearly one in five Americans are performing this kind of work. I know students of mine are performing this kind of work. Um, family members of mine are performing this kind of work. Um, and since 2015, that number has increased by a factor of 10 million. 60% um, of these people who provide this work are women. 60% um, of them are also involved in paid work, but are probably losing pay and benefits, including Social Security, from doing this. And 64% of these people have no paid help. Um, and a growing number of these people are reporting needing care themselves because as they provide care, their health needs uh, increase and that their finances have taken a hit as a result of caregiving. Now, we do not treat the work that these informal caregivers provide as part of our economic productivity, even though we wouldn't actually be able to function as a society if it weren't performed. Uh, there are valuation studies that estimate the monetary value to say nothing of the real value that this provides to people uh, as being somewhere north of $500 billion annually. Meaning if we, they weren't doing this work, that's how much as a society we would have to pay. I think that's probably an underestimate. Now during the pandemic, caregivers of this kind faced a double burden. On the one hand, they face the challenge of protecting their loved one um, that they're providing care for from COVID-19 uh, because increased contact, um, especially if they were remaining in paid work, if it was in person, without vaccination, or before the vaccine placed their loved ones at higher risk. On the other hand, uh, there's a high risk of severe disease among their patient population. Um, and so national surveys that have been done of informal caregivers revealed that a majority of them reported experiencing increases in caregiving intensity, which had already been going up before the pandemic, um, but the intensity of the care that they had to provide, in part because of the pandemic and the associated um, health risks, um, not just the, the uh, disease itself, but uh, uh, risks coming from that disease, uh, intensified, caregiver burden intensified, and that was also not evenly distributed. Uh, women experienced that increase in burden far more um, than men, which I think tracks with what was going on before um, the pandemic. Um, of course, there's also the case in which caregivers were diagnosed themselves with COVID-19. Um, and uh, they also, it's not as if their caregiver burdens went um, away. Um, this increased care burden is associated with lower levels of mental um, health and, and well-being. Now, to think about this as a crisis that went on during the pandemic, it's important to understand what was going on before it, which was the United States was lagging behind other uh, wealthy democracies in terms of the support we provided for informal uh, home-based care. Uh, we're the only wealthy uh, post-industrial democracy to not guarantee a uh, paid leave and only a small percentage of, of, of employers offer it. Um, there are policies that address or try to compensate caregiving, but they're really, really, really residual. Um, there's something called the National Family Caregiver Support Program, which includes support groups and individual counseling does important work, but it's incredibly residual. It's underutilized, little known, underfunded. Um, there's an unpaid leave uh, program, FMLA, highly time bound, also unpaid. Um, there's something called the dependent care tax credit, but it's highly means tested. It's buried deep in the tax code, only applies to caregivers who are employed, um, not those who are unemployed or out, out of the labor force who comprise a large section of caregivers. They're also not eligible. Um, and uh, those tax credits, in any case, even if you're able to uh, qualify for them or you know that they exist, it accommodates for a, a small percentage of the income that you give up while you're providing uh, care. Now, um, I should say also that there are medic a sort of patchwork of Medicaid uh, consumer-directed personal assistance programs, but they can be very difficult to navigate um, as well. Um, now, 
One question would be, how did we get there before the pandemic? And I think there are two things to think about. One, as the ethnographer Sandra, Le uh, Sandra Levitsky has shown, um, there's a hegemonic belief system that prevents caregivers from actually becoming politically active and, and mobilizing for support because they do not believe what they're doing is work. It's their own personal responsibility. So that's part of it. The other thing though, is as my work has shown, the policy architecture we have to deal with this um, has really experienced drift. We designed Medicare and Medicaid, we didn't plan for the care needs that people would have for, for a very long period of time. And when you look at when Congress has tried to expand programs uh, for, for uh, unpaid caregivers, they face really three challenges. One, um, there's no real strong committee support structure in Congress that addresses the needs of aging and disabled people. Two, there's been over the last 30 years, a bipartisan preference for austerity, which means that anytime you have a program that actually spends money, the only thing that Congress is designed to look at is the cost. There's no real cost benefit analysis of what that program would do. And partisan polarization ends up undermining support for social spending package. But I should say that the support for austerity here uh, in these spending packages is bipartisan. So these policy failures meant that we had a huge workforce of informal caregivers. There were an extraordinary amount of risk during the pandemic, financial and health-wise. Um, but our burden and what we were asking them to do only increased. 